Yes, almost done. Yes. So, good afternoon. As usual, I will not talk, but for about four or five minutes, usually. First of all, I would like to acknowledge and thank Professor Bob Merton for having accepted promptly our invitation for being the guest speaker. But I would like to thank him also for another reason that I will leave, this is kind of a surprise, to the very end of my very small talk. Also, to thank the pro-chancellor, Professor Maria de Graça, she is not here. She will end this session for allowing us to host the conference at this uh, university and in this island, because I don't belong to this university. I belong to another one. Um, and to thank to all speakers, my Long-time friends, Michael Brennan, Bill Goldsman, many, Heitor Almeida, Gert becker we found some funny things when I was a centuries ago, a um, PhD student somewhere in England. Julapa Giacchiani and Soli uh, Marofa, that were incredible accepting my invitations and John's invitations for these fintech sessions on all the panel, the panelists. Of course, to all participants, well, just the first statistic, we have to say something, 43, 43 countries, as well as to our sponsors. Several reasons, we needed more sponsors than usual. <laughs> To my colleagues, Gianluca and Ettore Croce, and obviously to John Lucas, another very, very, well, sorry, again, white hairs, longtime friend. It is almost impossible to organize such a complex and huge conference without his permanent advice. And a very large experience of all sorts. Thanks so much, John. Uh, it will be almost impossible to organize with, without your uh, advices. Last but not least, my co-chairs. Wow, this is a very sentimental type of moment. Um, no fear, no anxiety, but happiness. Uh, Pedro and Gualta, my ex-students several years ago when I used to travel to teach MBAs here, uh, and to our secretary, Susanna, for their, I have no words. Uh, these are very modest words, for the outstanding efforts, dedication, efficiency, because I was two hours away <laughs> to manage a conference two hours away, so I take care of the, mostly from the scientific part, and, and as well them, but logistics is such a difficult thing. Uh, dedication and efficiency, for dealing with a highly complex and diverse uh, logistical problems, in particular in these areas. Very difficult. Uh, related to the organization of this event. I have to stop. Emotion came on. Please, join me with a big round of applause to them, please. Uh, as usual, 
here are some other, this is the standard thing, uh, other standard statistics, as far as the FMA is concerned, this conference. We had uh, about 600 submitted papers from all continents, blind reviewed by a very large and highly prestigious, as you could see, program committee, around 197 huge members of the program committee. The refereeing process was obviously very tough, so that only 250, 250 out of 600 papers were accepted with 84 parallel sessions. Uh, now, last but not least, oh, it is a bit a kind of embarrassing. <laughs> I would say to introduce Professor Bob Mert, and ah, it's just kind of embarrassing. Um, I don't want to be offensive to the audience, <laughs> but I would like to, to make a few remarks. Yes, several honorary degrees, many academic, very many, and professional appointments, very large number of awards. You see, I, I saw your CVs, about 30 or 40 pages. No? All over the world, mostly by invitation. Currently, he is a member of many advisory and editorial boards, prestigious journals, publications. Let me see if I'm not lost. And it's enough. Last, last but not least, he won. Let me see, I did this to Bill Sharp when I, I organized this conference in mainland Portugal, and I said, hey, Professor, you won a prize that I, I cannot remember the name. I'm getting old, so please excuse me, but I don't remember the name of this prize, so uh, it's very tough to, be, to get old, so on and so forth. But this is uh, my final thing, the, the surprise I have for you. Uh, finally, Professor Bob Martin, and certainly you don't know, but centuries ago, you did influence my PhD dissertation somewhere in a very well-known university in England, because I went to the United States later on, quite a lot. And I was at that time looking for a kind of a black hole, desperate for finding some potential contribution, reading everything, and all of a sudden I read your paper centuries ago, I repeat, <laughs> with your, I think your student, and Rickson, in relation to the puzzling results as far as the negative and persistent. Oh, Bill is, I'm sure, very well aware of this, of this paper. The persistent negative correlation between, at that time, uh, selectivity and timing. Now, now I'm not working exactly in this area, but I began centuries ago working on this. And as to the performance of mutual funds, you, at that time, this was puzzling for you. And I said, wow, I want to grab this puzzle because I can work on this. Many people, they did work. You, yourself, you gave potential explanation, but no, not sure why this was uh, observed in many other countries in the world, I did that for hundreds of mutual funds in the UK, exactly the same phenomena, and Canada, this, and that, that all, all, everybody was finding this thing. So many people gave several explanations, and I had the opportunity to give my own. I will offer you a 
20 pages of this potential thing. So thanks so much once again, also because of this. And the podium is yours. Please, Professor John. Wow. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. I thank you for all coming this evening. I thank you for inviting me to come and take part. And of course, I thank the university for providing the venue and the uh, support for this event. Uh, you know, in terms of that introduction, if I were a truly rational man with capital R, capital M, what I would do this evening was get up as I am now, say, thank you very much, thank you very much, and sit down. Because I can't possibly meet up to the expectations that you created with your fine words. Uh, but of course, I can't do that, so I'll do the next best, which is try. Uh, the topic for tonight, I mean, I think it's suitable for this occasion, the EFMA, is a little different in the following way. In all of the various sessions you've been talking about, presenting work, I sat through a few this morning, where you're sometimes giving final results, sometimes preliminary results, sharing with us where you are. It's all about the science of finance, either the empirical work, theoretical work, observations, hypothesis formation, or hypothesis testing. That's the application of the science. What I want to talk about to you tonight is the end product. In other words, as a science, as a place to create new knowledge, that's fantastic. That's true of all the sciences. But finance, particularly finance within economics, I think has a special place in that the most sophisticated and best theoretical research and empirical research has found its way into the mainstream of practice. And this has been going on for about 40 or so years, 45 years. So tonight, I really wanted to talk to you about solving real world problems using our science. And that's the, the focus for this evening. And uh, OK, so I'll just say a few words about the importance of finance. Part of this, I confess, is due to the crisis of 10 years ago. There were a lot of narratives that came out, as you, we are all aware, saying that, you know, that uh, finance doesn't do anything. I think it's moving the uh, chairs around on the deck of the Titanic or things of that sort. And that uh, wasn't clear what value was being created, but maybe a lot of damage and so forth. I'm not going to resurrect that. Um, it's an interesting narrative, just as I don't think seems to be supported by the data. So I think it's useful sometimes to take a look at our field in that context and say, you know, it's great to discover new knowledge. I'm, I'm all for that. But isn't it even more great to have that new knowledge have an impact on society? And no question, a well-functioning financial system is essential for growth and economic development. You know, some of you know of dichotomy, you know, the real economy and the financial economy. As far as I know, that only exists in out-of-date macro textbooks, not in the real world. Those two are intimately and exceptionally connected. And well-functioning financial system is essential. Bob Solo, uh, my colleague, professor, and so forth, MIT, received the Nobel Prize for his work on growth theory. And his insight, both first theoretical and empirical, was that growth didn't happen as a result of particularly population growth or frugal saving but rather technological progress. And that was a great insight, and, and you know, now we take it for granted. Now, how do I bring that up in the context of finance and development? Because at my home school now of MIT, we have fabulous stuff in the labs. You wouldn't believe that the people can do. But if it stays in the labs, it's never, none of that innovation will ever impact the economy. The only way it can do it is to have that technology widely disseminated and integrated and applied in the economy to do it. Finance is all about doing things like getting resources to the right place, getting the funding done, and managing risks, and so forth and so on. 
So I just remind you of that, that any of this idea that there's a real and financial sector that are in any meaningful way uh, separated, I don't think that's a, a good sign. Now, the other point I wanted to make to you is that I've already mentioned about crisis. First of all, when did finance become a science? Now, I'm sitting with Will Gutzman, and any of you have gone to his many papers, including his website, The History of Finance, or the, you know, the Story of Finance, I certainly recommend it to you. So I'm not gonna try to compete with that. I'll just give my little piece for tonight. And my piece is, I think that finance became a science in 1952 when Harry Markowitz did his paper on portfolio theory. Now, I don't mean Harry is the father of finance, but he was there in my metric at the beginning. It was his work that marked it. Prior to that, finance was, in my view, mostly anecdotes, some uh, a balance sheet uh, uh, identities, uh, accounting identities, but most importantly, no data. You can't have a science without data. Now, those of you who work today can't imagine it where you have millions of bits and bytes and so forth that you can access and run runs and do things you can't imagine. There were no data. So uh, starting with Harry, I'm not gonna run through the whole group, but you have people like Ken Arrow, you had the Modiani and Miller pieces in corporate finance, and you have Jim Tobin bringing the risk-free asset in, you had uh, of that sense. And then we went into the 60s, and uh, we developed uh, the important database at CRISP that for the first time looked at all the data back to 1926 and came out with a 9.3% is my recollection, as they randomly picked stock for the years from the 1920s up to the 60s. And that one piece of data, or one number, shocked the world just from the data, because nobody had earned, no trust departments or professional had earned 9.3%. And here you could just, you know, pictures of people throwing darts at the Wall Street Journal and being able to get returns that were better than, their, you know, and uh, so that was really a very important step in making this into a serious science. <clears throat> also in the 60s, you have uh, Sharp, Lintner, and Mosin developed the capital asset pricing model. And I was talking this afternoon to some of your colleagues and said, actually, that saved the trust departments. Why? Because what did it tell us? All stocks don't have the same expected return. They shouldn't, even in a world with perfect information and so forth. We have different expected returns depending on what? Risk, how do you define risk? That thing when it's larger, the equilibrium expected return should be larger. What do we know that is in CAPM? Beta, okay, so beta became a measure of risk. Now why do I say that saved all the professional trust departments and so forth? Because probably the randomly picked stock, the average stock or the randomly picked stock, was far more risky than any trust department would ever put in a portfolio. And so they had a perfectly legitimate statement that yes, our average returns weren't as high because we didn't take as much risk. And of course, the whole industry of performance measurement and so forth. Well, I'm not gonna run through all of that, but I do think the 50s and the 60s were uh, when it really became a science. It has data, it has theories, it had hypothesis testing, it is a science, okay? And of course, we've had a few Nobel Prizes given for it, which I know is one form of certification. So your field is a science as much as any. Now, another feature of finance that I really indicate is that of all the fields of economics, it's probably the one whose most sophisticated theories and most sophisticated empirical work are adapted into the mainstream of finance practice. It's very unusual to have that strong connection. I believe that th that wasn't always true. That happened starting in the 1970s and due to a series of events, including shocks to the system, which created all kinds of risks that had not been seen for a long time. And the response, very different than the sh response in 2008-9 crisis, was an explosion of innovation. And that innovation, and that's where I'm coming to how do you improve the financial system, that innovation was driven by three items. One, innovation in finance knowledge, call it finance technology, not computers, but our understanding of the subject of finance. The things, some of the ones we illusion, then of course we had all the stuff on option pricing and everything that came in in the 70s as well. That's the theory. What else did you have? You have computer technology. We have 
talks here on fintech. Fintech, well, fintech's very important. I could talk about that all night, but I won't. But I would point out one modest little thing. It's not new. We've been using computers and models and data in our field for close to a half century. And the things that happened from that period on wouldn't have been possible without them. Now, not at the same level, so I'm not putting it down. It's very important. But I think it helps well to put these things in perspective. This isn't the world we've never seen before in the sense that we've been doing this in our field for a long time. Uh, so I just wanted to frame that context. Now I'll get to what I want to talk about tonight, and that's background. But financial innovation is how you improve the financial system. The drivers are finance technology, 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 and the third one is need. I can tell you as someone who's been doing innovation and implementing it for a long time, that you can't sell $5 bills for $3 unless there's an interest or a need. Very difficult to get innovation. When you look at when innovations are implemented, one of the key drivers is need. Those are the three items. And so now let me move down. So, oh, this one I put in, this isn't mine. This is, I borrowed it from one of my colleagues. This is a timeline of innovation. Going back to the 12th century, this is in your neighborhood, Will. Um, and you can't see it very well. By the way, the slides are available to you. These are terrible slides if you have to read them. But they're really for you in case you find something interesting tonight that you'd like to look at. But you can see from the picture what? Not only has innovation in finance been going on a long time, but what can you see by the scaling? The speed of innovation is accelerating dramatically. So two, two pieces of implications from that. Well, the first one is that's good for our field. It looking, you know, we've got a lot to do, and it's going faster and faster. So those who say, gee, I wasn't around 10 years or 20 years or 30 years ago for all these things, well, you haven't seen anything yet. It's going to get better and better. But it also tells you that in doing things in the real world, big projects, best practice is not good enough. Best practice is the usual way that often companies and, and uh, governments go about big projects. And it's not, because best practice means it's practice, which means it's already a legacy. If you see the speed of development, if you start doing things for the future based on the past, you're making a huge assumption of very little change. I don't think that fits the data. So you best practice should be looked at, but it's nowhere near good enough. And don't accept that it has to have been done in order to be worth doing. So I thought I'd show you that, and now we'll move on to the... What I want to do is take two examples, two examples of two problems that finance science and finance, let's just call it that, we are able to, is able to address. And they are in real time, meaning these are problems of now, these are solutions, or at least that are going on now. They're work in progress, but they're real progress. Do you understand? So I'm showing you something that's going on right in the moment. And I picked two examples. Uh, you can see, if you can, one's from China, but it's not really about China. It's about a class of, of, of problems for society which involve government policies. And often government policies are in conflict with one another. And you have to make changes. And I'm going to use capital controls and stability versus growth. And I use China because China is a good prime example. September of 2015, China reacted to a big decline in its stock market after it had a big rise by shutting down futures markets and doing all kinds of things that were clearly understood would be disruptive, certainly disruptive to growth and uh, several things, but in the name of stability. And we see all the conflicts which have to do with the issues of governance and so forth, and that's not uncommon. So what I'm going to show you is an example of how you can use financial innovation financial science to mitigate, or in some cases, eliminate that conflict. That's a good thing to do. So that's the first case. Addressing multiple conflicting, what appear to be conflicting policies and finding a way to address it. The second one, this will be a fast one. I have to make it fast or we'll be here all night. Uh, that's okay with me, but probably not with you. Um, it's easier to be up here talking than sitting out there for a long time. The second one, comes from the area of retirement, where 
we all know there's a global, and I use the term crisis, at least I would call it a challenge, for funding retirement in the future. And this is around the world global problem everywhere. Even in the Middle East where they're very, very young people, it's a problem. But it's certainly in Asia, you know, it's one of these things like the comedians. The United States is Asian. We're going to have baby boomers, 10,000 a day retiring. But China's Asian faster than the U.S., Korea faster than China, I think Taiwan faster than Korea, and maybe Singapore will come in there somewhere too. The point being, this is a big challenge in the world, and I'm going to show you in, so it's really real time this is going on, a way, a solution, not to the whole problem, but how to bring in and really address the problem. And I think, so this is kind of a big case study. It's not big, but it's a case study, okay? You ready to go? Yes? Okay. So let's start with the China one first. And here's the situation. Stability problems, fear, you know, the run on the thing. So they, I don't want to say panic, but they made a decision, among other things, to put on capital controls. Not completely. I'm going to, for analytical purposes, act like it's a complete capital controls, and then you can do it for partial capital controls. And they just put a whole bunch of things of that sort. Now, did they understand that that was disruptive? Of course they understood it was disruptive. But the decision was, as important as growth is to China, stability was apparently trumped it. I hate to use that word, but anyway. So, sorry about that. Um, now, let me show you a cost that we in finance can measure quite well. If you had complete capital controls in China, what does that mean? All the investments in China have to be held by Chinese. And all Chinese making savings have to put all their savings in Chinese assets. That's what it means. So what I did here, I used data from 1993 to 2017. This is because you see a lazy professor. I'm not really an empirical guy. And so I had a colleague that had these data. I said, I'll use them. Because I'm not here to show you the numbers to run an account or something. I'm showing you with real data to show you the point. If you do it for different periods, you'll get different numbers, but you'll get the same answer. Do you understand? So these are real numbers, but there's nothing important about 1993 other than that's where my colleague's data set started. And so what I did is ask the question, I just used MSCI World as the world portfolio, said, what was the ex post risk return that you got for that period investing in the world portfolio, the best diversified portfolio, global diversification, right? I'm not saying that's actually the best diversified portfolio. Well, that's a concrete number. And we get some sharp ratio. I call that way the way my sister's portfolio. You don't know, I have two sisters, actually. My younger sister's the smartest one in the family, and she's smart enough to know she's great at what she does. She knows nothing about finance, so she holds a zero alpha portfolio, as we all understand. And so she's, this is what her menu was. But if you invested only in China, of course, then you couldn't hold the world portfolio, but only China. Now, this is what it looked like if you held China in this period. Now, I don't need to show you that the sharp ratio here ex post was a lot less than for the world. But that's not terribly interesting. It's unfortunate for China, but it doesn't prove anything, right? Because you make decisions ex ante, and then there are ex post outcomes. So what I tried to do, I have no idea what the expectation was for the world portfolio in 1993. But what I can do is say, ask you the question, or ask the question, if China neither underperformed or overperformed expectations, which is kind of saying it performed according to expectations, what would you have predicted China would do conditional on what the world did? So this is not an absolute expectation, a conditional one. While it's conditional, it is an expectation. So that's the thing you really want to compare to see the cost. That's what I did here, that's the green line. So had China had a negative alpha <laughs> ex post. By the way, I would note, China's a big country, right? Number two, was this a growth period for China? Well, I think so. How did it work out? I don't know the reason, but ex post, it didn't work out well. So you're just seeing a concrete example that just having a big country that's a growth country doesn't guarantee you that you're gonna get something close to the optimal diversification, but that's just a side point. So does everybody understand the green line? And you can see there's a spread there. That's one cost and a very big cost of capital controls. 
You see, you're not getting what you could get. We just say as an order of magnitude, that's 300 basis points a year, about 3%. If you want it in context, 3%, remember the rule of 72? Maybe you don't know it. You should learn it in case the batteries all go out on your calculators. The rule of 72 is how long it takes to double your money at an interest rate. You divide the interest rate to 72. It's a pretty good approximation. So 3% will double every 24 years, roughly. 24 years is a, a short generation. So the way to scale this loss is to tell China, if you could get rid of this cost, the size of NCSSF, that's their pension fund that vests all the assets of China in their pension fund, would be twice as large in 24 years. That gets attention. That's a big number, okay? So what are we gonna do about it? I'm not gonna argue about capital controls. That's beyond my pay grade, and people have been arguing about it again. What I'm gonna to try to do is say, how can I get rid of this side effect, the cost of capital? Nobody wants to lose 300 basis points a year, not the stability people, anyone. It's a side effect, just like when you take medicines that makes you sick. You know, you've seen the television ads. This will cure you, but on the other hand, you may lose your liver or you may have heart attacks or God knows what happens to you. And I think all of us would rather have for the same efficacy of our medicines, ones without side effects. And I presume everybody, if we're gonna have capital controls, would rather avoid this 3% a year loss side effect. So how can we do that in this world and do stability? Well, here's a, an answer. And by the way, in successful, especially large scale innovations on big projects, it's not gonna get you tenure if you do that. Why? Because the most successful innovations use things that are already proven, that are, you don't have to do anything new, you just do it in a different way. So it's innovative, but it's not innovative like, you know, in tenure you gotta do an original piece of something. You're not gonna get tenure for this, but it's wonderful for implementation of innovation because you're not asking people to do things they've never done before in large scale. Do you understand? And so sorry, you gotta pick. You can do both, that's what I've tried to do. So here's the answer. You have all the assets, all the A shares of China being held by CSC, all, you know, all the institutions as they would, and, and people, but let's say the institutions, that's where I'm focused, all right? But now they have a very poorly diversified portfolio, that's that 3% a year loss, okay? So how can we get them, get rid of that poor diversification, but, sort of meet the stability conditions of capital controls, um, okay? And what I propose here is a total return swap. Now, you all know what swap contracts are. They're, they're kind of magical because they're so simple, but we've been doing these for decades and in large scale, so this is nothing new as a contract at all. We know we can do that. Everybody's understood it. China uses them, everybody uses them, so we don't have to have a new legal system or anything. And what we do is we get China to do a total return swap with other institutions outside of China. And the swap would be that China will, on the swap, pay the total return on Chinese A shares. And what will it get back? The total return on the world portfolio, my sister's portfolio. If they can achieve that, we'll move the risk return frontier for China up to my sister, get rid of the 3%. Agree? Now, like many things, that seems pretty simple, and it is. That's good. It's easy to understand. But like all things in the real world, when you actually do it, execution is the key. How do you actually execute this? Because to make it work, you've got to do 100 billions of US dollar amounts of this. It doesn't do you good to do 5 billion, 10 billion, something. You have to do it in massive size. How are you going to do it? You're going to get Goldman Sachs to go out and try to place $100 billion worth of Chinese A share risk or something, and then do you really want to have no disrespect to Goldman Sachs or Deutsche Bank? That would be another choice. Um, but you know, having a hundred billion dollar contract with a bank is something that probably most governments would feel a little uncomfortable about. Nothing against the banks. So how would you do it, and who would do it? Well, quickly, just to show you how it's important. If China has too many. A shares, what's true about the rest of the world? It has too few. Everybody wants to hold the market portfolio, right? I mean, that's, so it's the adding up condition. China has too much, the rest of the world has too little. So even me, a teacher, not a you know, fancy investment banking placement stuff, 
I know there's demand for this. How much? About the amount that China needs to get rid of. So I know there's demand out there, then all I have to do is find an efficient way to get it. How do I do it? Well, I'm not going to go into all the detail, but let me suggest the following. There are probably about 40, 45 institutions in the world that are really, really big. In China, it's SAFE, the reserves, it's uh, CIC, the Sovereign Wealth Fund, and NCSSF, the retirement. In, in Norway, it's the Petroleum Fund at $1 trillion, GIC in Singapore. You understand, you've heard all of these. are big institutions, but there are a very small number of them in the world. So I just get on you know, my horse and, or whatever, and I go around to these institutions, and I say, I know you want the A shares because you can't get them, and you want to have a well diversified call. You don't want to be below my sister either, okay? Guess what I have for you? I have a supply. So the fast pass is I already know who the demanders are. I don't need to hire high priced, high cost uh, investment bankers. And they can talk to each other. I can put them all in a room. Look how many people are in here. We can put them all in the first four rows. You, I'm, you, you get the feeling. I mean, I'm not going to go into detail. And that's a story they can understand because it's not an information trade. It's some, a position they always want. So they don't have to worry about, hmm, you know, I don't want to trade with anyone who wants to trade with me because they have information. This is not about information. They have to hold these positions all the time. And they all have a need. And guess what? You all know how you, you probably learned in, or teach your students in first year finance how to figure out the no arbitrage value of a swap for a traded asset like A shares. That's not exactly a rocket science calculation. So it's actually pretty easy to set the price on these things. You just get a third party who people trust are going to do the right thing. You don't have to know very much. And you just say, we're going to do the trades at that price. So you see how I got supply and demand together? And because I know how much the supply is, I know how much the demand is, they're going to match. So I don't have to bribe anybody in the form of high premiums to be on one side of the trade or the other. Everybody wants to be on the trade that they're on. Okay. If you don't get all the lyrics, I hope you hear the melody of what I'm saying. To do innovation, you have to drill down beyond just writing out a theoretical model, you know, here swaps as a way to move uh, risk around. You actually have to solve the problem, how you actually execute it at low cost and worry about it. And I'm saying this happens to work very well that way. That's kind of the message. So if you do this with no cost, then you solve the problem. Now, wait a minute. Have I solved the problem? I have to convince the Chinese to do this. They're the ones who put the capital controls on. Now, in the room, I'm going to pick you. You're the group from China that makes the decision. I'm not going to look for the ones like maybe Will or somebody who I know kind of think this is a good idea. I'm going to say, who's the stability wonk? Who's the one who says, I don't care about growth, I don't care anything else, the only thing that matters to me is stability. If I can convince him or her, I've got the rest of them. So always go to the toughest one, not the easy one, okay? So I'm gonna pick on you. You're the one that says, stability is all that matters to me. End of story. So I'm gonna say, okay, you want, your, your model is capital controls, no flows in and out. If you do the swap, you will have flows when the swaps settle. That's a violation, right? Because there's a flow out. But remember, you already know in advance how much will flow and under what conditions. It's not like a run on the bank where people can take money out. That's why you put capital controls on, so you can't do a run. This says, whatever the difference in the returns time the amount, that's the amount that pays one way or the other. So you know the exact date, and you know the quantities, and it's limited. So right away, that's a pretty good sign. You see what I mean? So it's flows, but it's not. But what's the killer? Let me ask you the following. When the swap settles, under what conditions will China have to pay money out? Well, China pays A shares, return and receive world. So if China is net paying out, it means what? It means A shares went up more than the world. Are those tough times for China? No. You don't need capital controls in those states of the world. In fact, things are tying. So sure, it goes out, but it's going out only because China's outperforming the rest of the world. Hallelujah. That's not the picture you saw <laughs> in the graph, but that's history. What happens, though, when China underperforms? 
Money actually comes into China, no choice. Now I ask you, Mr. Stability, he's a mister because I picked him as a, he happens to be a mister, I think. And I said to him, so what is, which is more stable? No flows or money coming into China when China does more poorly than expected. And in fact, the more poorly, the more money. And money goes out, of course, because it's got to balance when times are good. I won't argue any further, but do you see that looks a little more stabilizing than no flows? If I can convince you of that, then I've moved you from your position. You agree, I know I'll get the rest of the table. Sorry to do it in this fashion. I don't know any other way to tell the story because I don't, you know, it's so easy to write a model up and then people say, yeah, that's right at 50,000 feet, but when you actually try to do it, how are you going to do $100 billion? So I wanted to give you enough of the flavor. You really can do this. And it's non-invasive, as derivatives always are. If you no longer want it, you, if somebody comes up with a better answer, you just reverse the swaps. You don't disrupt the country. You don't have to form any new institutions, no new organizations. You don't change how people work. And once these flows come in through the official sector, so China can have great control on it, China likes to control things, then they can do swaps with local banks and asset management companies, and now you can distribute down to the retail level a world portfolio in a world which has capital control. I think that's kind of a cool application of our science. Very simple, but elegantly simple in the same way that the original interest rate swap took the biggest risk out of banks, which was mismatch of maturity serving customers off the table forever, okay? <clears throat> well, that's about as fast as I could think of doing it without doing it. So now we're gonna come to the second problem. Take a breath, I'm, 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 I am anyway, okay? So what did that do? Just before I, well, I'm taking my breath for this new one and you're getting settled. We got rid of the cost of capital controls, and then I'll let you debate capital controls. But everybody, I think you can get unanimity agreement that nobody wants to lose 3% a year. So you can get uniformity in, in everybody voting for it, even if some people don't like capital controls or think it's wrong in the idea. Do you get that? That's the thing. And it's non-invasive, and it's done with no new institutions, no new contracts. All of them are market proven. They've been doing them for decades, so they feel comfortable that they're enforceable, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the flavor of that. And also, by the way, it deals with governance. You know, if Canada, literally everybody in Canada held the world portfolio, what percent of the world portfolio was Canada? What, 1%, one percent, one and a half? That means Canadians would only own one and a half percent of Canadian shares. That means foreigners would own an overwhelming majority of all of Canada's industry. And you can replace Canada with the United States or anybody else. A lot of countries don't like that, having foreigners outside of their control, controlling all their industries. You notice all the A shares are here by, held by Chinese institutions. Right? The only thing that's exchanged is the returns. And Norges Bank doesn't want to vote the shares of the Chinese companies. That's a pain in the neck for them. So the swap solves that problem. So if you have a governance issue as a political matter or as a social matter or a national security matter, this solves that. You can have the governance done and so forth. So I just want you to feed. Okay, so now let's go to the one that I mentioned, which is the world retirement challenge. You all know funding retirement is a big challenge. We're talking about it in every country. And what I want to talk about is we're going to come up with one piece, one innovation to address a very direct and very important problem in the, uh, all of these countries. By the way, the design of this as well as with the previous one was not China specific. It was a world solution. You could apply that in any country with capital controls. It has nothing to do with its culture. It has nothing to do with, it doesn't even matter if it's a socialist country as long as it's got prices. I mean, you know, in the sense of who owns what and if they're trading and so forth. So global design is a good thing in the first place and we're gonna do it again here. Now, one of the realities everywhere in the world is that individuals are going to be called upon to take more responsibility for their retirement funding than they did in the past. In the past, you had Social Security, it was all done by itself, you didn't think about it. You had DB pension plans, you know, you, 
You showed up to work. They told you when you were 27 what will happen when you're 65 and so forth. Everywhere in the world, it's going the other way. One way or another, people have to take that. That I can't do anything about. There's reasons for why that's happening. So, and that's a big challenge because people are being asked to make important decisions about their lives. They've never had to do in the past, don't know how to do in the present, and frankly won't know how to do in the future by getting education. The idea we're going to give people education on the internet on this is, to me, it doesn't make any sense. Okay, and that's one of the challenges we have to do it. So I'm going to show you how to do it. The second thing that, you, that since it's global, the design, is many countries, a good number of people in the country are not covered by any retirement plan. Not Social Security, not the government plans, not corporate plans. They have none. But they still have the need to satisfy the function of funding retirement. All of those in the unofficial sector, you know, you, you know they're, they're, and in some countries, that's probably half the population, okay? So this was designed to deal for people in any country with this. The only requirement I have is that there's a government bond market. But other than that, it will, in principle, should work everywhere, okay? So we call this thing selfies. And uh, Arun Madhahar and I have, are co-authors, and we brought this out about a year or so ago. And it's got a lot of tension in the world. I'm not telling you that, say, hey, that's good. It got a lot of attention from the right places in publications because it touched the right buttons. It's of interest, so I know we're on the right track. I'm not saying this is the best solution. In fact, everything I showed you tonight is a floor. It's doable, I told you about it. I would expect if you put your mind to it in certain countries, you'll do better. Do you understand? So this isn't the answer, this is a minimum. Okay, so the reality is we have to do that. And so what we're doing is we want to provide a bond innovation to allow people to fund their retirement, or at least to help with that. First, before you can do that, before you optimize, we have to agree what's the objective? What's a good retirement? Everybody would like a good retirement, at least as a goal. What's a good retirement? Because if you don't know what a good retirement is, you know, it's like if you have a travel agent, really good, efficient and everything, they can't do their efficiency unless you tell them where you want to go. So you have to have a goal. The goal we choose, a good retirement would be if you could sustain the standard of living that you enjoyed in the latter part of your work life before you retire for the rest of your life. So whatever level you're living at near retirement, a good retirement is if you could sustain that for the rest of your life. Now, we all would want more, but I don't think very many people want to dine on crystal in retirement and live on dog food while they're working, or vice versa. Modiani, Frank Modiani, who got the Nobel Prize too for the life cycle hypothesis, basically said the same thing. Okay, so this is not original with us for sure. In fact, it's very common. But our definition of a good retirement, because when you evaluate the solution, it's related to what the objective is. A good retirement is sustaining the standard of living you enjoyed in the latter part of your work life, not the average from the time you were a student or something, but how you're living beforehand because that's where your mindset is. That's where you've settled in. That's where you use. I'm sure there's plenty of behavioral things that would support that, you know, it's everybody wants more, but it's really tough to take less when you've gotten used to something. Do you understand? So that's the goal. Now you know the goal. Let me show you what we do. All right. <clears throat> What are selfies? Well, selfies is a acronym or has a for standard of living indexed forward starting income owning securities. That's a mouthful. Basically, though, here's this, what it is. We said we made the following observation. People love pensions around the world, every culture. I cannot find one employee employee group in the world who marched on their employers and said, get rid of our defined benefit plan and replace it with a defined contribution plan. One exception is South Africa, maybe, but there were special circumstances there. That's not really an exception. So all the arguments to people like annuities and stuff, we all know is the annuity puzzle, and that doesn't interest me at all. Millions of people in every, about just about every culture around the world for decades love pensions. People love the Social Security payments. They like the idea they'll get a check every month 
No matter how long they live, even if they live to 120, as the good books have wished us all, maybe technology will make possible in another generation or two, okay? They like it, they never run out. Now, I'm not going to argue about that, but that's my belief. I think that's far better and stronger data than these various surveys that are done that, that sometimes say people, oh, no, the modern person doesn't want that. You don't test it by looking at your introspection. Why? Because if you're in finance, you either are or will be in a higher standard of living than working or even middle class. That's because finance is probably the most highly compensated uh, legal profession in the world. I'm not talking about drug dealing or something, you know. Okay? I mean, no, the reason I point you out, because you know, I work with innovators, they're in finance. And they'll say things like, well, I wouldn't do that. And I said, this isn't for you. Don't use introspection to design something that's not for you. And you're not the representative group for the, what's really the issue out there, which is working middle class. The very poor have to be, the poor have to be dealt with differently. You can't do it through a pension. Uh, that's, you know, I won't get into that. And those above middle class, upper middle class, or affluent, mass affluent, I'm not worried about them. There are other things for them, but that's not what the pension system's about, okay? It's dealing with the vast bulk of people that we would define in that class. So with that, what we're going to do is design a bond which looks like a pension. If people like pensions and you need a pension, you don't, you know, you need a pension, but you don't, you don't belong to any plan. So we're going to get you a bond you can buy that's like a pension. So that's the simple idea. So what happens when you have a pension, public or private? You make contributions one way or the other, or your employer does it for you. Well, that's your money, right? They could have paid it to you, OK? You put your money in, what happens? Nothing until when? You retire. So what's the cash flows? Cash flow out from you when you contribute this month. And when do you get any, do you get any cash flow during the subsequent years? No, right? They don't pay you anything. You don't get a return or anything, right? They don't send you any money. Then what happens? When you retire, you take the money and they pay you what? They pay you in a pension. They pay you whatever, you know, a stream of income for the rest of your life. You got it? See the pattern? Out? Nothing for a long time. You know, if you're 25, that's probably 40 years, even if you retire at 65, and who knows when you'll actually be retiring, right? Long time. And then at the end, what do you get? A stream of level payments for a period of time, let's say for life, and nothing more. There's no balloon payment. That's what we do with the bond. So that's what we're doing. All we're doing is creating a government bond. You all know what a government bond is in whatever country you're in. You know how they're taxed, you know how they're, you know, their safety, their security. Full, I'm talking about full faith and credit government bonds, no, no games, okay? The risk-free asset in terms of payment. Now, you might say, well, some countries might default. Sorry, I can do nothing about that. I treat full faith and credit government bonds as risk-free for this purpose. Not because they won't change at default, but because I have no control over that, and nobody can write you a contract that is. I'm not talking about taking your money offshore as some wealthy person and putting it away. I'm talking about normal people, <laughs> okay? If the government defaults, all rules are off. You have no idea what will happen. They might take 40% of everybody's bank account. You think you own stocks, you're going to be protected from that? They can take stocks. I can show you around the world that that happens. So, I can't do anything about that. So for the purposes here, I don't care who the government is. I'm treating, if they have full faith and credit, that's the best I can offer you as risk-free. And that's the best that any pension plan in the country can offer. Take a look around. How many pension funds or pension pools of governments have been, ex <laughs> I don't want to say expropriated, but let's say redistributed uh, with governments that went off the ranch? I can't control that. So do you understand? So I treat. Government, full faith and credit is risk-free, even if reality is they may change the rule. All right? So if we have that, then what we're going to do is we're going to make this anticipated payment start from the bond the year you retire. Then what we will do is we'll issue these bonds, and they'll be issued in two ways. They'll be issued in large denomination, and I'll tell you who would buy those, as government bonds are done now at auction. That establishes price with serious buyers. You know, buyers of government bonds in auctions 
are not college professors, ribbon clerks, and taxi drivers. They're the most sophisticated investors in the world, sovereign wealth funds and so forth. And so, and they buy in large chunks and so forth. So it's just like our government market now, okay? So the price discovery here will be done that way. However, the government will issue selfies in very long, uh, very small denominations to be bought, and they will be issued like savings bond, priced off the auction markets. So you have a disco price discovery, no subsidies in this. We're not trying to subsidize or anything, but how do we get something that can be easily bought by people at low cost and small denominations and also have a market price that you think is doing it, and that's how we do it. The bonds trade off at auction for the big, you know, for in the millions and so forth or more units, but the bonds that you or anyone else can buy will be in very small units. Do you get the idea? So you get the advantage of savings bonds, low cost, small denominations, but at the same time, you have price discovery that you can believe in. Okay, and I'll show you later how that happens. All right, so that describes what we want to do. That's, so one thing is we're going to change the pattern of payment from typical bonds. You know, typical bonds, you know, you have, you, you put your money in, you get a coupon every six months, and then you get a balloon payment at, at retirement. Well, this is just a government bond, but with different payments. But you see, the rest is all the same, so I don't have to educate you on the credit. It, nothing, if you pass away, these bonds are left to whoever you leave them to. They're not, nothing disappears, there's nothing, do you, do you understand? It's a bond. Okay, so now let's talk about what else has happened. So the payment pattern is different than a bond, and we're gonna also change what the payments are indexed to. There will not be nominal payments, dollars or euros or whatever, okay? Now, you're all familiar with indexing for inflation, right? I mean, you know, in art, my country, it's tips. You have them here in, in Euroland and so forth. Okay, that protects for inflation. But we're not gonna index them to that. We're gonna index them to per capita consumption. Not GDP, but per capita consumption. And I'm gonna show you why. It turns out when you do it this way, you're gonna see it makes life really simple for people buying bonds. If you do things right, it works well, okay? So two big differences, think of regular government bonds, we're gonna have different payment pattern, and it's gonna be indexed to per capita consumption. Got it? Only, that's the only wrinkle. Now let me show you what happens with this, okay? So let's take a hypothetical 26-year-old, plans to retire at 65, 2058, okay? And he has a goal of 50,000 in retirement. You can put any number you want in, obviously. How does he get that goal, or she, it, okay? I'll tell you how you do. I say, what are you living on now, or what are you earning now? For most people working middle class, those are roughly the same things. You know, you can have a replacement ratio, but basically I just say to you, what are you living, you know, what are you earning now? You know that, right? Everybody knows that. Someone with a sixth grade education knows that. Why? Because they have to know that to survive. You gotta know what you're getting in so you can figure out what you can spend. And people know how to do that because they have no other choice. I'm not talking about people who are impaired or something. I'm talking about normal people. So this is not the asking them to come up with something they've never done before. This is, they do know what they are living on or earning. And since they're working middle class, they don't have properties, they don't have stocks and bonds, they don't have lots of other sources of income. They're living on what they're earning. That makes life simple for this, but these are the audience we're after, or at least primarily. So they know the answer to the question. So I just say, suppose it's $50,000 is what they're getting now. So I say, okay, what's your goal? Well now, let's each selfie, all selfies pay $10 a year. So you don't have to, you know, they pay $10 per year per bond. 
when, they, when you retire. So remember, nothing, and then when you retire, you get a level payment, level payments of $10 a year. Of course, index, but let's not just think of it as $10 a year. How many selfies as a goal does this 26-year-old need? Because you've got to have your goal before you know where you want to try to get to. Well, it's pretty simple. Each selfie will pay $10 a year in return. And I tell you what your goal should be, 50000 whatever you're making now. So you divide 10 to 50,000. Do you see how they get to their goal, 5,000 bonds? Do you see that that's doable for an interested person, even with a sixth grade education? I'm not picking on people with sixth grade education, but John, I want you to feel that this is designed for the real world of all countries, not somebody who's learned about compound interest or anything else. So I want you to listen in the innovation, what information they need to make decisions. All right, so does everybody see how they figure out what their goal is? All right, so the goal for this person is 5,000 bonds. Now, they're 26 now. What about in 14 years when they're 40? They might want to ask themselves, how am I doing? You know, am I close, am I on track for my retirement? Am I behind? Because they're going to have to make their own decisions to buy selfies. I mean, they're going to have to spend money for it. They have to know how they're doing. Well, let's say they've accumulated 3,000 bonds you know, in the last 14 years. What do they know? If they accumulate no more, what will they get? $10 times 3,000, 30,000 a year, starting in 2058, if they don't buy any more bonds. And they can contemplate that, why? Because they understand income. They understand what $30,000 a year means. Now they might say if they've been living on 50,000, no way. That's just telling you they don't have enough bonds, telling themselves, not me. Uh, they don't need advisors for this. They tell them that they see themselves. Or they might say, you know what? I need 50,000 because I've got kids, but when I retire, I don't have kids. They may not do anything for me, but I don't have to do anything for them, All right, okay? And I live a pretty simple life otherwise, so I think I could live on 30,000 then that's their choice. Then they say, hey, I'm, I'm, I've made it. Do you see what I'm trying to get? It's their decision, and they have been given the information in a format, in a way that they can at least evaluate it. They may make a mistake. They may have thought they did that and then change it. But you notice the thing is real to them. It's a real set of questions. It's not, you know, if you told them they have $332,650 in their retirement account, does anybody in this room know what that means in terms of income and retirement? None of you do, because you can't know unless you look at interest rates, forward rates, work it out, God knows what, right? So telling them how much is in their account is useless. And they've never seen that much money probably in one place in their life, so they may even think they're rich. But they do understand that $30,000 a year is a style of living, because remember, everything is in the background corrected for all the changes, so you're looking at current income to figure it. So they don't have to project what will I be needing when I'm 30 years from now. They're looking at now. That's real. Do you, do you see the point? So they know two things. They were able to set the goal by themselves very easily once you told them the rule. And secondly, any time in the future they can evaluate where they are in a fashion that's meaningful to them that they can understand immediately without any education at all or anybody advising them or sending them to the internet. Got that? Because this is the important parts of the features of the design. Okay, now I think this is one way to deal with the challenge of financial literacy. I don't believe we're gonna train people to do compound interest or any of those things or learn off the internet any more than we do that with our surgeries or anything else, okay? But this is at least our attempt to make it really simple for everyone because I think survival depends on study and income, all right? So now you see how we would process. Now, someone might say, hey, look, we already have tips in, in the United States, those are the inflation bonds. We have 30-year tips. Not perfect, I mean, you all heard this from investing, right? We can't exactly match the payments, but it's close enough. It'll be okay, right? So we've got 30-year bonds. Won't that be approximately okay? Well, let me show you the difference, because I want you to see the detail. This slide shows the stream of payments on a selfie. 
You buy the selfie, that's a cash outflow. There's no payment on the selfie until 2058. And then there's a level set of payments, let's say for 25 years. It's no longevity, there's no, can't put longevity in a bond, because then the value of the bond depends who, on, who owns it. That doesn't work. <laughs> That's not a bond, right? A bond's worth a different amount if you pays for life of the owner, so that doesn't work. I'll deal with the longevity. Don't, don't try to confuse us. I mean, don't start worrying about it. So think it's, it'll actually be about 22 years. I'll explain that to you, okay? So does everybody understand the payments? What happens if I, and, and what does our person who buys the selfie do? Suppose the, he doesn't change his goal, and there's good reason he probably won't. He may change, you know, we, who knows where you're gonna be, maybe you're gonna work to your 80 or something, but by and large, there's no reason to do that because if you look what it's indexed to, if it's just indexed to inflation, you've got a problem, why? Inflation will get you to the right answer if there's no changes in standard of living. But if you have changes in standard of living, having inflation protections, you're gonna be disappointed. If standard, I'll show you pictures. If standard of living goes up, remember the goal is to have the standard of living at the latter part of your work life. So if you've been you know, getting standard of living up, forget inflation, standard of living, you've gotten used to living that way. If I've locked in my style of life today for 40 years from now, you know what, I'm not gonna to be too happy with that. And it violates the goal. So why we use per capita consumption is per capita consumption covers both inflation and the right inflation, not GDP inflation or the deflator. Why? Half of China's expenditures for a long time were investment. You don't eat investment in retirement. You consume. You're making a big stretch when you assume that GDP is the same as what you want. Why bother with GDP when the, the best answer is consumption? That's what you're trying to do. That's what people care about in retirement. They don't care about what other expenditures are going on in the economy. This is not investors in stock trying to figure out what something's worth. This is people just trying to buy something off the shelf like you buy a car. So we made per capita consumption because that's what matters. It gets the right inflation number. I mean, it won't be matched perfectly to each individual, but that never happens with an index. But it's picking consumption, which is what matters. And the standard of living is measured in terms of consumption, not GDP. People's consumption may not be going anywhere. Remember, we're trying to give them the standard of living they're living in, not what the economy has. So that's why we do it. By putting it in per capita consumption, we cover them both for inflation and for standard of living. And that made it easy to tell him how many to buy in his goal, why? Right? Because for most working people, they have a phase where they go up, you know, apprentice, journeyman, master, assistant professor, associate professor, full professor. There's a scale where you go up. And then what typically happens for working middle class? More or less, any gains you get are standard of living gains generally, and inflation. Which means if you index it to those two things, what you're doing now, once you've got over the transitory beginning stage, what you're doing now is a good estimate of what you'll need, except you don't have to do any forecasting. You know, if you're protected against inflation, you don't have to, infla you don't have to forecast inflation. If you're protected against standard of living, you don't have to forecast that either. And you don't even have to think about it. Do you see the point? That by designing something that fits the risk pattern of what their objective function is, matches the goal, we also eliminate the need to think about a whole bunch of variables and analysis and forecasts that we really don't want to make. We don't need them because we protect it against them. I'm just, you know, this is a fast pass, but this is trying to show you why we could tell them that 5,000 selfies was the right amount because we indexed it to the right thing, okay? So now what happens with payments? He, he buys the bond goes into a, you know, through a government, like a savings bond, buys it, we hope at very low cost. He knows how many bonds he can afford to buy, all right? Once he buys them, does he have anything that he does for the next 40 years? No, there are no payments on the bond. There's nothing to buy, there's nothing to sell, there's nothing, no payments to be reinvestment. Do you see that? It's a zero. 
And then when he gets to retirement, if he's like most pensioners, what does he want? I mean, a stream of income. How much? The amount that he planned on if he's filled his goal. So he actually never has to transact again. The only reason he'd have to transact is if for some reason he found out he was only going to live five years and these are going to pay for 20, he might sell it and do something. Or if he decided, you know, that he was going to retire at a different age, he'd sell and buy a somewhat different one if he wanted to. Do you understand? But for most people, like a pension, the amount that's going to come out is exactly what he wants. So on transaction side, how many transactions does a selfie require? One, you buy it. And expectationally, you never transact again. That's very important when you have transaction costs, especially if you're buying little bits and pieces, you know, $49 worth or $68 worth. You, okay? Now let's compare that to the, to the bond. Uh, I'm probably blowing the time here. but um, Here's the tips bond. You buy it, there's the money out. What happens then? You get a coupon every six months for the next 40 years, or 30 years, excuse me. How many coupons is that? 60 coupons. 60 times this person with a sixth grade education is going to get money, then take that money and have to figure out what to do with it. We hope reinvest it for retirement, but you know, that's another juncture, okay? But if they do, do you think there's some transaction cost involved? Like, first, that person has to think about it. That's a transaction cost. What do I do with this coupon payment? And then when they decide what they do, they actually ex execute it. Do you think you're gonna get a good trade? <laughs> Friction. What do you think the transaction costs are gonna be on $50, $75 roll, even with FinTech? <laughs> okay, and FinTech's not a magic either. 60 of those. But it gets worse. What happens in 30 years? In 30 years, he gets this big balloon payment 10 years before retirement. What is that person supposed to do with this big chunk of money? They got to figure it out, right? At what rate can they reinvest it? That's 30 years from now. You have no freaking idea. It may be that rates are very high, or it may be that rates are very low. We've lived through that in the last decades. Decade, right? What I want you to see is a practical matter that while some people may wave their hands and say 30 years is good enough for approximation, it's a terrible approximation. It requires them to make enormous amount of decisions and incur huge transaction costs, taking off from work to go there or some, whatever they have to do to do the 60 times, then a big payment, and then God knows what they do with it. So sometimes it's better to have a suit tailored than say, hey, it's approximately, yeah, it's a little long, it doesn't fit, it was actually done for a woman, but you know, nobody will notice, okay? <laughs> These are times when approximations, actually we're trying to show you, are very costly. There's a difference between a successful design to do what's supposed to do and something that's gonna be a disaster. Because you know most of that money will get dissipated. God, no, I, I'm not going to convince you of that. I think it's obvious. So the point is, by making it tailored to the thing, you deal with a whole bunch of the behavioral and the whole bunch of the transactional costs, and you have no education you have to give them. Because the only thing they're thinking about when they make a decision, whether to buy some more selfies or not, is something they already know how to think about better than anyone can probably tell them because they know their own circumstance and it's framed in a context that they understand to survive. So you put it in a framework that matters. All right, now let me show you why we did the cash payouts index to per capita consumption. I use Singapore here, I've done this for many countries. Korea, very different in numbers, but it's the same pattern. If I show you Korea, the numbers are huge. But that's because of Korea's history. Singapore, another successful Asian country over the last 40 years, but different pattern. But none of those patterns are going to repeat for those countries. Korea is not going to repeat what it did over the last 40 years, neither is Singapore or Hong Kong. Okay? But you can look at the cross section of them and realize how much variation there is in standard living. Anyone says, hey, standard living grow up at 2.3% and that's it. 
The answer is no, that's not close to reality. That's like saying interest rates all will be 4%. Ask people who tried to retire when uh, <laughs> tips were, if you want to protect the inflation, were 39 basis points, long-term tips. They were auctioned at 50, but then they went down to 39. You know how much money you have to have at 0.39% interest to fund? A lot of millions. And it wasn't always there. Tips have been as high as 4%. So people who cavalierly say it's good enough approximation, it'll converge, if you subject it, as all scientists do in their fields, to the actual data, that's, that narrative isn't true. And it may never have been true, but it's certainly not true now. Okay, what I'm showing you here is if you just get inflation for, this is for uh, from 2010 years, 20 years, 30 years, and then from 61 on, which was right before Singapore went independent with Lee Kuan Yew. Okay, here's per capita consumption, inflation, standard of living. Now the shortfall here is, if I just give you inflation but not standard of living, how far less will you be than you should have been? Do you understand? So in 10 years, you're at 0.92. You're 8% less than you needed. In some countries, it's much higher. But Singapore, 8% is not a small number for working middle class. They don't have, they're not poor, but they don't have a lot of flexibility. They're not going to be selling off the second car. All right? But look, over 20 years, it's 0.74. Over 30 years, 0.46, and of course, over the whole life, it's 0.18. But I can tell you, it goes up and down. I mean, now, you might say, well, what about stocks? I don't think I put it in here. Maybe I did. Yeah, I did. Okay. Now, do you see why inflation protection is not enough? You can see from the graph. That's standard of living. Does that look flat? That's the assumption that you would have to have in order for inflation to be good enough. Tips. Does that look flat to you? And again, if you saw Korea, it makes, this is relatively modest. So that's why you need both to meet the goal. But if you do it right, you make life really simple. All right, so now the next one I would quickly show you, these slides, is what if you invested in stocks instead of selfies or treasury bills? Well, I computed that for stocks. And you can see over here, for the last 10 years, Stock market did poorly in Singapore. You'd be down 28%. <sighs> On the other hand, if you did it for 20 years, you'd be at 122. You would have done better than selfies. Good for you. If you know it's going to go up the way it did over those 20 years, I'd advise you to buy it too. The problem is that's ex post, and we have to make decisions ex ante. That's the ex ante for 10, 20. And then this is for 30 years, it's a little better. What's the message? If you're willing to take risk, it's the same message we all know. If you're willing to take risk in stocks, you may do better, and you may even have a favorable expected return. I'm not, we don't need to worry about that here. But you can also come out less. Explaining risk to people of that sort is a pretty complex process. But if you don't have enough, you can't save enough, that's the only way we take risk is, we take risk to get somewhere we can't get risk-free. At least that's an intelligent decision. You know, how much risk and so forth. But what I'm saying is stocks does not solve this as a surrogate. Stocks are stocks, and as we use them now, they're great if you need to take risk, but they are risky in the long run, in the very long run, in the super long run. What everyone's told you, sorry, it's not theoretically true, it's not empirically true, and it just, one thing I would mention, take a look at Japan over the last 30 years. Nikkei at 39,000, it's now 28,000. Six years ago it was 8,000. Second largest GDP in the world for most of the time, third largest GDP, politically stable since World War II. Nothing strange, and it's still a wealthy country. But if you bought the stock market at 39,000, it's 28 after 29 years you better have a plan B if the market doesn't work out. You cannot just assume it away that in the long run it'll happen. So don't confuse selfies and what it's offering with the stock market, although this is what we will need if you don't have enough saving. All right, now, um, 
Let's talk about who will be the users of selfie. Who did I design this for? I designed this for countries where just people have no pension. They're in the unofficial sector, or they just aren't eligible. Korea, pretty well, they have the National Pension Service there and so forth. And Korea is, you know, it may be still the very years of developing or emerging, but economically, it's, I'm talking about South Korea, um, it's pretty good. But probably somewhere around 25% of the people in Korea are not covered by the public, you know, the Social Security or the corporate plans. So even in a country like that, there's important parts of the population. But in some countries, it's huge. This is robust because it doesn't matter if you have a big unofficial sector. We're not trying to induce people to save. That's a different problem. Talk to Dick the Eller about that or something. This is, if people want to save, we're giving them a way to do it. It's very efficient, very un understand. You don't have to get education. So we're not trying to convince people that's someone else's department. It's, these are people saying, I want to do this. How the heck can I do it? This is what we're offering, okay? So this is uh, the first group. But who else is going to be covered by this? That's who we designed it for, one group, but an important group. How about people in Korea who have the National Pension Service? Well, let me tell you something. The National Pension Service in Korea at the moment is capped at a 41% replacement ratio. You know what that means? It means if you're living at 100, the most you can get is 41. Now, I want you to do what my sixth grade education person. Contemplate in your life getting 41% of what you're living on. Now, for you, you've got a lot of slack. You'd probably be, maybe even, you'd probably be okay, actually, maybe. But if you're working middle class, going from 100 to 41%, even if you don't have to save anymore, is a big penalty. So don't, so who's going to need this? People who say, you know what, I've got the pension service capped at 41%. I want to have a decent retirement. I'm going to need another 20 points, 61% or 30 points. They buy selfies. Notice the selfies are sold, you know, not by maturities. They're more like target date funds, although they're terrible, so I wouldn't want to associate. He bought it. We just tell this guy, buy 28, 58 selfies. And he never has to buy anything else. It's like, you know, if you go to the store to buy shoes, you find out your shoe size. What happens when you go to the store once you know your size? You say, I have a size nine or nine and a half or six. They show you where the shoes are, and that's the ones you buy. You don't buy a 12, you don't look at the 12s, and you don't look at the threes. Well, same thing. When you go to the government store, you know you need a 2058. That's the date that you're planning to retire. And you always buy 2058 selfies. You never change what you buy. You're always buying 2058. You're always a size 2058. About as simple as you could hope. Now, if you change when you might want to retire, like all goals, you know, your travel agent worked it perfectly for you to get to San Francisco. You decide you want to go to Dallas. She rebooks to the new goal. So we rebook you to 2062 or so. That doesn't happen very often, and it happens maybe once in a lifetime. And nobody really knows what they're going to do until they're very close to retirement anyway. So you really don't know what's going to happen. So the best you can do. So do you see the information again is always the same number that you're buying? So that's the second group. Who's the third group? Many people in this audience, are, well, I shouldn't say this audience, but those from the United States for sure. Everyone in a defined contribution plan has to decide what to do with their money, right? You're responsible, whether you have a, you know, if you can afford an advisor, you don't have a problem, but that's like saying let them eat cake, okay? So what do you have to do? Well, this is a perfect kind of thing to put in a, in a mutual fund or something or put in there to offer people the selfies they can buy. And again, because they get standard living, many of the reasons for taking risk, by the way, are not just you don't have enough. They say, but you need to catch up with standard of living. So stocks will probably be correlated with that. So one of the reasons to hold stocks, even if you are saving enough, is to keep up with standard of living. That's a typical explanation. Like it used to be before we had inflation bonds. They say, well, you hold stocks or real properties to keep up with inflation. Now, we know that is a bad tracker, but it's better than nothing. Now, if you're, if you're indexed both the standard of living and inflation, you have much less reason to take risk because you, you now get the benefits of standard of living. And again, if you're getting that, then you're getting covered for what you need. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's a minor part. Not minor, but it shows that you save on that. And so 
People with DC plans will want to use them. Who else will want to use them? We've been talking about retail, sixth grade education. Every freaking institution in the world, whether they're pension funds or insurance companies writing annuities, will buy these things off the shelf like you won't believe. Why? Because they are exactly tailored to their liabilities. They can look at their pension plan if they want to. They can look at every individual in the plan when they're actually retiring and how, you know, they can look at the detail of their plan, not some brand, you know, not uh, example number six that's closest, the exact plan, and you can buy selfies to match it perfectly instead of an approximation, and approximations always require reserves, they're inefficient. So I can, that's what I'm very sure of, that both pensions and, and insurance companies will buy these for the risk-free part. They can take risk just like the stock market, but for the risk-free part, these are perfect, okay? So I could sell these to institutions, all right? I mean, even I could as a teacher. So you understand institutions will buy them. They're the ones who are gonna buy them at auction, by the way. Remember, you were wondering who's buying them in the auction? They will in big size, because these are big, big plans, okay? So, what did we discover? We started out to solve sixth grade individuals who don't, aren't part of any plan, and we came up with something that fits them, but it also fits people who are in plans, it fits people in DC plans, and it fits all the institutions who are acting as surrogates for you, creating DB plans or social security. So we actually have a pretty good demand, but now let me add one more. I think you might like this in this crowd. How many people remember Doug Breen's famous paper, The Consumption Capital Asset Pricing Model from 1979? Probably before many of you were born, but you, you could at least uh, appreciate the paper. What was Breen's, I thought, brilliant uh, finding? He took in my own paper from intertemporal CAPM, which was really old, we won't go there, um, I showed that everything's efficient and all that, no information problems, so it has nothing to do at all, that in equilibrium, you have multiple risk factors. Instead of the CAPM kept security market line, you get a security market hardware plane because there are other dimensions of risk that are non-diversifiable and that are systematic that you don't see in the CEPM, one of them being obviously changes in the investment opportunity set. Sharp ratios fluctuating, interest rates fluctuating, which never show up in the CPM. it's a one period model. So if you look at that paper, now that had the same idea as the CEPM, but more complex. You have a hyperplane, you have other dimensions of risk. That's why you can show that you, have, you can have perfect markets, full information, and the CEPM will still fail, okay? What did Doug Breeden show? He had to make a few more assumptions, but not bad ones. He showed that if you had an asset that was perfectly correlated, not with the market, not with wealth, but with consumption, the security market line works with respect to that. So the hyperplane of many dimensions, many factors, you want to call it, collapses to the old CAPM result, except instead of beta being with respect to the market, Wealth, it's beta with respect to consumption. Does that, I hope, remind you? What does that tell you? It tells you in a much richer intellectual, you know, modeling environment, one with stochastic interest rates, changing sharp ratios, stochastic everythings, okay? What does it tell you? If you can find an asset that's perfectly correlated with consumption, that's the one you want for the best diversified portfolio, the same way you think of it as in the CAPM. And you want to add alphas to it, that's just window, you know, that's refinement. Do you think this selfies are gonna be pretty correlated with per capita consumption? I think so. Not perfectly, because you'll have capitalization rates, right? So who's gonna to want to buy it in the last group? Every investor, having nothing to do with retirement, will want this asset. You see why? Because it's in the same way that every, all institutions have core equity, which is nothing more than indexing for, for uh, a diversification, then they add their alphas to it. Okay? So, something that started out to be a solution for a very special group, but a big one, 
in many countries, has turned out that it works for a whole bunch of people. Now, why is that good? One, it helps deal with a lot of problems that we hadn't been thinking about. But number two, if we pull it off, I'm not worried about there not being deep markets because there's natural demands, institutional and individual of all kinds, for all kinds of institutional designs, DC plans, DB plans, social security plans, blah, blah, and finally for general investment. So those are the users. So we thought this was kind of fun. And I know I'm running very late with you and you're being very kind, but I, you know, I only get to, the last time I did this was 10 years ago in Milan, if anybody was there. So I, every 10 years you're gonna have to put up with me. Now, I started out with the assumption saying, these are government issued bonds. Now a fair question to me is, well, why, why government bonds? Why not private sector bonds or somebody else's bonds? And I have, I'm gonna answer that. I'm gonna to explain to you why government, I'm thinking of US government or the full faith and credit of the country government. You could have cities and states in the United States issue them. They're not quite the same credit, but they could issue them. In fact, it could refine it to their own state's consumption. I think that's probably not worth it, okay? But why would I pick the government? I wanna show you that's not a random or a, it's just an assumption. There's real reasons. Number one, selfies have no credit risk. Why? Because they're full faith and credit. I've already talked about governments defaulting, so that's not, a, we consider this as full faith and credit. The same way a US government bond is full faith and credit or any other country's bond is. What does that mean? When I told that sixth grader, buy, figure out how many selfies you want and everything, I didn't say, well, that's what's being promised, but of course, what's promised is not paid, that's called potential for default. And let us explain, because the next question would be, even from a sixth grade education, well, if they don't pay what's promised, when do they not pay me and how much? You're now in a quagmire of trying to explain risk. You're dead with this. The whole idea of this thing was to keep costs, abs and the whole thing very simple. So if it's US government, even the SEC in our country doesn't require it to have disclosure of risk if it's full faith and credit government. So that's the number one reason. You don't have to explain risk. You'll get what you paid. What's the second one? If this is gonna be a main feature in the retirement system, you have to have a supply, not when times are good only or when people feel like issuing. It has to be a supply all the time, be made available. Because otherwise, you know, people go get their selfies, they can't buy them. That, you, you can't have that. So governments is close to that. One, because governments are always borrowing. And two, they, they do perform market completion functions. That, you know, that's a natural function of government. Just why the US were the only ones who could, the government was the only ones who could produce tips. Even in, I was in the 1970s inflations of 10% and I was dealing with retirees as a faculty member and so forth. Everybody said they wanted inflation protection. No one in the private sector could issue it. Why? Because they had no asset to hedge it. Commodities were not good enough. Timber was not good enough. Real estate was good enough. Stocks were surely not good enough. Because you have to have an asset that's very close in pattern to the liability if you're gonna issue a lot of this stuff, right? And no private sector had it. So the best we could do is have a government do it, which put the maximum base of risk that you could do for the thing and embedded trust. But what do we see here? The US does not have a national sales tax, a VAT. Many or most countries do, and I suspect looking at the numbers that someday the US will have one as well. Okay, so the US and Hong Kong don't have VAT. I have, we have ways to adjust for that, but let's not. What is neat about the government issuing the bond? If it has a VAT, it has the perfect hedge. You know what a value added tax is? It's called what? A consumption tax, right? The way the value add works, it adds up to the final consumption. And it's a percentage, you know how, I mean, if you're in a country that has that, right? So the government, has on its balance sheet an asset, VAT, which is perfect, almost a perfect hedge. In fact, as a side, in countries, I won't mention Argentina, for example, but in countries where you don't trust the accounting, you know, how do I know per capita consumption is really being measured right? Maybe they'll keep it low, not to pay much. You could index it to the VAT revenues divided by the tax rate. Then you have a perfect hedge, and that's gotta be as good an estimate of consumption, you know, for people, because no one has precisely the index anyway. So 
it all works. You can do it in countries they don't trust the accounting. You just, and those who want fiscal responsibility and worry, you can do these like revenue bonds, you know, like bridges. You can have bonds that are issued, a certain amount of bonds are issued for which can only be used to pay, uh, you, know, the fund, you know, the tax can only be used to pay the selfies for retirement for which they were paid. Because remember, people are contributing. It's not being given away. Okay, does everybody get that? That's a pretty good reason. I'm almost finished. The fourth one, remember I was trying to convince you, there's always a debt management type in the room. And they say, all I care about is the government funds at the lowest price. I say, good, guess what? When you do market completion, you're providing a security that the market wants that they can't get, you can get a premium because there's a demand for it and you don't. Therefore, your funding costs will be lower. And real world examples beside tips are the 40 year ultra lines in Japan, which I had a little bit of it, so I know what was going on, which were issued 100% for only one reason, market completion for pensions in Japan and insurance companies, not to lengthen the life of the funding of Jap Japan, Japan Inc. And they even have a model that if the auction, the interest rate's too high, meaning it's overpriced, I mean, it's too costly, then they adjust whether they'll even do the funding. So they are clearly doing it for that purpose. And last, and this was the final kicker, and thank you for, I know I'm standing between you and dinner, but we got a long dinner planned. <laughs> so I want to get your juices up, okay, if I can. But let me point out something else. Has anyone heard countries saying, or people saying for countries, we really need to do something about infrastructure, like my country, which I love, and I don't want to be anywhere else. But I have to say, JFK is an embarrassment in the richest country in the world as the gateway to the one international city in the United States and New York. And you've gone to any other of the airports in the world, JFK doesn't look very good for the richest country in the world with the gateway to the one international city. I'm picking on that, not that that's the most important infrastructure. A few bridges are falling down and a few other things, okay? So you agree, infrastructure, right? What's the cash flow nature of an infrastructure project? You lay out a lot of cash, right? And then it's a long time building the bridges, the airports and everything before you get any cash revenue back, even the services, right? And then you get the services later, so that's the funding. What if you're a country that doesn't have super rating and you want to borrow to, do, to fund infrastructure. If you issue five or 10 year bonds, what's the problem if you can't issue them? Well, first of all, they're coupon bonds, right? So you actually, since these things don't generate any cash, you have to borrow more money than you need. You have to borrow the money to give back to the lenders. You got to pay them their coupon. So you borrow the money to pay them back their coupon. That sounds really efficient. But what else happens? What's the risk? Let's say you have projects that aren't start, don't really start paying for 10 years, and you've got five-year bonds. So you borrow the money, five years, you've got to repay it, right? What happens if you're in an environment where the bond market for your country or maybe for your region is having problems, meaning it's time of stress? You can't roll the bonds. Well, you could roll them at 14% or something like that, but I mean, you can't roll them at a reasonable price. What do you end up with? Half an airport. You did the project, you didn't get there. So there's huge risk as well as cost. What's the beauty of selfies? Look at the payment pattern. People voluntarily buy them, it's what they want. You're not bribing them, they want it. And you pay them nothing for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, our example, 40 years. That's pretty cool. And finally, I would mention those who are aficionados of government debt, there's a big difference, whatever debt to GDP is, there's a big difference between having locals own your debt and foreigners. Italy, long before the Euro and everything, had a huge amount of debt to GDP. But Italians held all of that debt. And that was a much more stable debt market, government debt, because the locals' liabilities were lira. <laughs> foreigners' liabilities are something else. And so, for locals, the risk of devaluation, or if you like, uh, you know, currencies, or were very, very different. 
as we've discovered in Euroland, when you've had one currency, right? And so when you borrow in a foreign currency, it's a very different story on both sides. Retirement creates an enormous amount of holdings. So you, the debt market, I think, for these countries, other than the most you know, quadruple A's, are gonna be far more stable because both the timing of the payments, you, you don't pay anything back for a long time, but also who's holding them. It's being held locally by people. That's very different than having foreigners fund your infrastructure and pull the money and pull the funding when they don't like it. So I'm, I'm going through this and it's been a very long night and I apologize to you, but I, I think, you know, when you go through all of this, it's not a bad story. And I'm not trying to sell you on selfies. This is a big case study that you sat through, but sit back for a minute and let's think about what we've done, okay? Let's think about what was happening. We started out with a single problem, fixing retirement for people who don't have access to retirement plans. We designed it so it works in any country in the world, independent of credit rating and everything else, as long as it has a bond market, a government bond market. It doesn't have a private sector bond market, okay? We discovered that by putting the risk in the right place, we didn't have to bribe people to buy it. They were lining up to buy it. And what else happened? Remember our 26-year-old? What other information did he not have or she not have? Did I ever mention an interest rate? No. Did I ever mention a rate of return of any kind? No. Did I ever mention compounding or forecasting anything? No. How do they look at it? The sixth grader looks at it. Every person who's responsible for themselves living, they take their income and they decide what to spend it on, right? They have to do that, that's to survive. So you look at a car, you look at a Bentley, you say, I like the Bentley, then you look at the price and you look at a Camry and you say, I buy a Camry. So you're looking at your list and one of the things you buy is selfies. There will be a price for selfies. Remember, it's gonna be set at auction. You notice I didn't mention interest rate, why? I don't need an interest rate. Why confuse them talking about something they don't need to know? You only need interest rates if you're trying to convert wealth to income. <laughs> but we've already done that. So all they see is a price. Just, they know what they're buying, right? Remember, $10 a bond, they know exactly what they're buying. It's like they're buying a car or food or going to a restaurant or anything else. They know the price. They look at the price and they say, hmm, this year, uh, yeah, with all my costs, I don't know if I, maybe I can only buy two selfies or 20. That's a decision they understand how to make, just like they buy everything else. And they might say, well, maybe when the kids are older and out, I'll buy a bunch more selfies. That's at least a plan. They can think about that. But notice, no interest rate, no rate of return, so if you have negative interest rates that we have today, it's always hard to explain to people psychologically why we accept a negative interest rate. There is none, because there's no rate. It's a price. You want so many bonds in retirement, you want so much income in retirement, you buy it, just like you do a car or something. So I'll quit on that. But I hope if you get this, again, I mentioned you know, about lyrics. If I hear a song I really like, if I don't like the song, why would I care? If I hear a song I really like, the first time I hear it, she's singing. She's going, what? I have no freaking idea what she's saying. Not one word. But I like the song. So I put it on the machine, you know, the one that keeps repeating it. You know, you have one of those, right? You put the click on and it keeps replay, you know, replaying it. So I 20, 30, 40 times, and guess what? At the end of the 40th time, I know every word. So if you didn't get all the lyrics tonight, I've been throwing a lot of them for a long time. I hope you got the melody. Finance can solve real, big, broad world problems, and the way to design for the future in finance is to design solutions based on finance principles, not institutions of the country. You'll notice this solution works everywhere. I've devised retirement solutions. It's not about me, just telling you about feasibility. I've devised retirement solutions, one, one design that works everywhere in the world. I'm not saying that, look at me. I'm saying if it's designed, finance principles work everywhere in the world. Just 
same way that, you know, gravity is 9.8 meters per second per second at the surface of the Earth here in, in, in the Azores, and it's also that in Beijing, Sao Paulo, Frankfurt, and New York. And finance principles work everywhere in the world independently of culture. Not that culture isn't important. And, you know, sure, if I built a universal car, maybe Thais like red and Koreans like green, so I paint them a different color. In our world, we provide one fund, but the fund might be a USIT in Ireland, it might be a mutual fund in the United States. That's just a different packaging to meet the local regulations. So the last point is that I predict, but not precisely when, but it's already going on, that we will see that design is going to be based on principles, not just because it's a good way to do things, but because they work everywhere. And you reduce the number of products you have dramatically because you don't have a Dutch product and a German product and a UK product and a Chinese product. You just have one fund that does this or one thing that does this or a selfie like you've seen, okay? That reduced dramatically the number of products you have. It allows you to have essentially one very carefully watch risk management program instead of us trying to establish a risk management group in every country that's gonna look after those products with the same quality. Very hard to do, very expensive to do. And when you make an innovation to the product, if you have a single product around the world, the innovation goes into all the, every place in the world all at the same time. So you are creating new finance science. You're understanding it better. And I'm, I just look forward to all that you do to make this world a better place and, and really have a good time. And if someone asks you 10, 15 years from now, what have you been doing the last 10, 15 years? If one of the things you design actually succeeds to be used, making things better for millions of people for decades to come and getting paid for it. So that's not a bad proposition. And that's what I kind of leave you with. And I, again, I apologize for the long night, but this is my night. Give me a break, you know. <laughs> I don't know when I'll be back. Thank you. We have speed up this thing. John, please come here. Well, my duty tonight is uh, to present the uh, journal awards and uh, the conference awards. But before we, uh, I start you know, with uh, the awards, I'd like to um, uh, thank uh, the uh, university, the city, uh, and all the participants of the conference, um, session chairs, discussants, uh, keynote speakers, and uh, distinguished uh, speakers, uh, our PhD students, and uh, everybody else who has contributed to uh, the growth of uh, this organization. I also like to thank uh, those that they uh, work behind the scenes by evaluating papers, that is the program on MIDI, and um, the wonderful staff of uh, the University of Azores. Um, this could not be uh, possible 
without um, our president of the meetings and the co-chairs, that is uh, Manuel, Pedro, and Walter, and please join me to congratulate them. And for that, I'd like to present them with uh, the EFMA award and um, uh, the EFMA uh, certificate. Thank you very much. Of course, this meeting uh, would not be a success if uh, Ms. Susanna Sardina was not helping us all uh, in this meeting. And I'd like to uh, ask you to kindly you know, congratulate her for everything she's done throughout the year. Susanna. I'd like to take this opportunity also to um, thank our uh, co-presidents of the association, and that is uh, Professor Elena Becali and uh, Ettore Croci, who had an excellent meeting last year in Milan, and I'd like them to step forward to receive their uh, certificate. <laughs> For their certificate. I'd like to proceed with the um, uh, journal awards. We have, as you all know, we have three awards. Uh, the best paper award uh, voted by the uh, editorial board. Uh, the readers' um, choice best paper award voted by the readers uh, through the FMA website. And the top download award that is uh, based on the, um, the hits at the um, Publishers' website. So, um, okay, this is, oh, sorry, it's been a large, right? Okay. Yes, we yeah. The uh, nominated papers for uh, the best. Uh, uh, article published in the Journal of European Financial Management in 2008 are the following. And uh, the winner or the winners of this award are Professor William Grossman and Darcy Olkin. Nominated papers for the next award are the ones that you see on the big screen. And I'll pause for 
a few seconds so you can read the title and the author's names. Unfortunately, the winners of this award, due to family reasons and some health is issues, they were not able to be here with us. And uh, let's applaud them for uh, such a wonderful achievement. <laughs> so the winners of this award are J.K. and Jesse Schiffer. And uh, Professor Gutzman has agreed to receive the award on their behalf. So he's receiving two awards. Finally, the um, the top download award um, goes to Zida and Sophie Shiv, uh, who are una we were unable actually to be here because of um, our previous uh, arranged pre-commitments to other professional activities. Um, and we'll deliver the award to them, you know, in early September. Let me, uh, please join me to congratulate them for <laughs> receiving the award. And uh, here I can share with you the number of downloads that the first, the win the, this paper received relative to the others. 1,248. Uh, Downloads, actually. And um, with that, I'd like to proceed with the announcement of the um, conference awards. Uh, here we have, you know, uh, five awards. The conference award that is sponsored by Awards uh, of Gorton. Uh, the Larry Lang Corporate Finance, uh, the GARP uh, Risk Management, the EFMA Capital Markets, and the PhD Students Award. The nominated papers for the best conference award are the following. Please uh, join me to congratulate the nominated speakers. And the winners of this award are Richard Evans, Osgun Caracas, Rabin Musavi, and Michael Yang from the UEA and uh, the University of Cambridge. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I'm very proud to write. <laughs> You're from UVA. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. The Corporate Finance uh, Award, sponsored by Larry Lang, um, has the following, you know, uh, nominated papers. And the winners are Andreas Benz and Daniel Hall <laughs> from Castle University.
Risk Management Award sponsored by GAR as the following, you know, uh, nominated papers. And the winners of this award are Kate Doral Almeida, Christine Watson Hawkins, and Ryan Williams. And uh, these are the Capital Markets uh, Award uh, uh, nominations. Uh, three papers have been nominated for this award. And the winners of this award are Dennis Baum, Roger Rodan, and Susan Aramazani Farr. And finally, we have the uh, PhD award, and we have uh, three nominated papers. And the authors of these uh, papers are the ones that you see on the screen. Alexander Barros from uh, University of Catolica, Luca Xiana and Lee from IS Business School in Spain, and Peter Burke from Tilburg University. Um, the students have attended uh, our PhD seminars in the previous years, and the feedback that we have been receiving from them and others is that uh, the annual PhD seminar has contributed considerably you know, to their knowledge of finance. And the winners of this award are, here we have a tie. Peter Brock and Alexander Barros. And now I'm formally announcing uh, the EFMA 2020 minute, uh, uh, meetings. And I'd like to uh, ask uh, Cormac to step up uh, to the podium to share a few uh, things with us and uh, reveal partially uh, his plans for next year. Good evening. Uh, delighted to be with you here this evening. My name is Cormac McGinley, and far be it from an Irish man to keep you from your dinner who culturally has a strong awareness of what, what famine needs and how to make the best of a good meal when it's made available to us. So briefly to speak of our forthcoming meeting in Dublin next year, we look forward to welcoming you in Dublin. We encourage you to participate. And if I can share a little bit with you, we, we always thought in Ireland that we were at the western edge of Europe before we came to the Azores, and I realise we truly are at the western end, end of Europe. So we'd like to invite you next year to come a little bit further east 
and to join us in Dublin for the annual meeting in Dublin. And while you're with us in Ireland, we hope that you have opportunity to experience, as some of us look forward to experiencing here in the Azores, what the, the great sites and places that are available to us to visit, Giant's Causeway in the north, Newgrange, where they've discovered the theory of light and movement before it ever ended up in Kepler's theories or back in, in option pricing theory and related matters, uh, where, the summer, where the winter solstice takes place here at Newgrange and indeed the Cliffs of Moher and the Rock of Cashel, which I'm delighted with, which I guess from my, from my point of view, my first name being Cormac, the Rock of Cashel contains the a church called Cormac's Chapel, which is a delight to myself, but it also perhaps represents something to say about Ireland being the place of saints and scholars. And we look forward to, to engaging with that also. And of course, our home city, Dublin. So I don't think Dub Dublin's an easy sell. Actually, Ireland's an easy sell this year. So just come for a pint of Guinness. We look forward to welcoming you all to have a pint of Guinness with us in Dublin, to enjoy the music, to enjoy all that, all that is around us. The Book of Kells up in the top right-hand corner there, uh, other representations, a, 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 a city that has presented many painters and writers to the world, including uh, Nobel Prize winners also. And uh, so we look forward to welcoming you in the city of U2 also, and to have that, that opportunity. Now, University College Dublin itself is established over 150 years ago uh, by Cardinal Newman. Uh, at that time uh, in addressing the educational issues of the needs of the, the population of the day. And I want to share with you briefly a quote from Cardinal Newman for, as, as a brief reflection as to what, what we do and a fact part of which what we've engaged with here today in, these, in this past few days uh, around education. It is education that gives man a clear, conscious view of their own opinions and judgments, a truth in developing them an eloquence in expressing them, and a force in urging them. It teaches him to see things as they are, that is to go right to the point, to disentangle a thread of thought, to detach what is a sophistical uh, matter, and to discard that which is irrelevant. So again, this process of engagement with knowledge as that we've been engaging with here this weekend, and we look forward to engaging with it further in University College Dublin. And also we will host our conference at this facility, the Quinn School of Business, where the Quinn School of Business is uh, relatively newly built. And we urged our dean, we said, we said, you know, we, need, we would like a little bit more space for the conference this coming up. So with that in mind, we took upon building a new extension and represents in the top right-hand corner here, at top left-hand corner from your side, a new facility being built onto the school currently, which will be even more state-of-the-art facility in regard to or, or needs going forward. Briefly, the Quinn School of Business and, and indeed the Smurfit School of Business, which is our graduate school, University College Dublin College of Business is well regarded and high regarded in the European context. We have a long standing actually MSc in finance. I'm not sure how many schools would match this, but at University College Dublin, where we have a ranked MSc finance program, we will celebrate next year its 50th anniversary. So we look forward to that, engaging with the celebration of our. our our education in finance in Dublin and again we look forward to having you join us and to join us also for what will prove to be looking forward very much to this dinner this evening a year from now we will have our dinner at Clontarf Castle uh, a facility a hotel um, that originates from a castle from about 1200 uh, so again, long-standing, and we look forward to celebrating, celebrating that. So please do join us in Dublin. We look forward to, a, uh, to emulate and to build on, and we're here in part learning from the local organizers, the local shares, and indeed from, from the, the, everybody else, and we look, we're engaging in that. We've been learning a bit. We look forward to further meetings, and we look forward to uh, engaging with the conference this time next year, and we will put our best foot forward, and we will be delighted that you would join us. Thank you very much. second.
Uh, the keynote speaker of uh, next year's meeting is Professor Robert Stambo from uh, Wharton. And um, we have plans for uh, many more academics of uh, his, uh, you know, um, stature. And uh, I'm pretty sure uh, you will be uh, enjoying uh, the next year's meetings. Um, and I'd like to close this by just uh, doing something that we have never done before. And that is um, invite the um, organizers of the 2021 EFMA meeting. Phil Holmes is um, the co-chair of the meetings and um, he's here to share a few thoughts about the meeting. Phil? Uh, thanks, John, and uh, I'm hoping not to take too long here um, because I'm hungry as well, as I'm sure some of you uh, are as well. But um, I haven't prepared any slides. I'll say more next year. So I'm just going to say a few words now and I'll go into much more detail next year. But I'm absolutely delighted that Leeds will be hosting the annual meeting of EFMA in 2021. It's the 30th uh, meeting and we're delighted that Leeds has been chosen to host that. And I look forward to working with John to put on a really good conference. And I'll say more about the city and the university next year. But for those of you who don't know much about Leeds, we're a very good university in a large and vibrant city. We have a population of about 800,000 in the city. We have fabulous transport links. So we have an airport, Leeds Bradford Airport. Or if you're coming from further afield, sometimes it's easier to go to Manchester and get the train across. But there are very good uh, transport links there, and it's a wonderful city. The university is one of only 24 elite Russell Group universities in the UK. The business school was ranked in the top 10 in the most recent UK research excellence framework. And the accounting and finance group at Leeds is extremely highly rated. We've already booked the venue for the gala dinner. It will be very different from tonight and very different from next year as well, I think. But I'm absolutely sure that you'll find it a fascinating and interesting place to visit. But I will tell you more about that. So stay calm and I'll tell you about that next year. Being British, I have to mention the weather. Um, one of the, there have been many advantages of coming to the Azores and one of the great things about the Azores is you get up every morning and you know what the weather's going to be like, not just today, but for the next few days. And what I can tell you about the UK and in particular the north of England is we will have weather when you are there. <laughs> it will be fabulous or it will be terrible or it will be somewhere in between. Tomorrow it's forecast a maximum temperature of 29 degrees. Next Friday it's forecast a ma maximum temperature of 18, but still sunny. Two weeks ago we had two months of rain in two days. That's the joy of the UK, but hopefully it will be good when you come, and I hope that you will enjoy it. I'm pleased to say that I'll be co-chairing the meeting with Professor Andy Marshall from Strathclyde University, and both Andy and I look forward to welcoming you to Leeds in 2021. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, please uh, join me once again to congratulate the organizers of uh, the annual meetings here at uh, Ponta del Cabra. Um, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Grasser, is going to say a few words. <laughs> and then we will finish.
distinguished Professor Robert C. Merton, Professor John Ducas, Professor Rocha Armada, Professor Walter Couto, Professor Pedro Pimentel, participants at the European Financial Management Association 2019 Annual Conference, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the magnificent director of the University of the Azores, Professor João Luis Gaspar, I would like to thank everyone for coming to the University of the Azores. It was an immense honor to host the annual conference of such prestigious association as EFMA, which has a very broad scope of influence and with the work it develops, and I quote, encourage research and disseminate knowledge about financial decision making in all areas of finance and it relates to European corporations, financial institutions and capital markets as an impact and influence on the financial management of institutions. I would like to take this opportunity to thank AFMA for considering us the University of the Azores as a venue and as the venue for this event in 2019. This is very important to us because we are an Atlantic, an insular and an ultra-peripheral university. We are a small university and we thrive to Persist, to, to persist, we have a solid spirit, an interpreneur spirit, and we are resilient. We are here to fulfill our mission, and we need our partners. And EFMA is now one of our partners. I would also like to thank all those who have been involved in organizing this meeting. Fatima Vieira, André Mendonça, Hugo Moreira, Rui Amaral, Carlos Rocha, Aníbal Bairros, Isabel Fleja, Leonor Lessa, Eduarda Torres, Susana Sardinha. And all those the, that directly or indirectly contributed to this event. I hope that the work developed during these days was prolific and that you all enjoyed your stay in university and in the Azores. On behalf of the magnificent director of the University of the Azores, I declare this session closed. Have a safe return home. Thank you. Ah, please. Regroup outside. We will make a 15, 20 minutes walk until the Coliseu Michelens to have our gala dinner. Thank you all.